Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Sunny by Cold Wednesday afternoon of Chem 170 with your host, me, Dr. White. See, I got my winter sweater on still. It's cold out there. It's almost the end of April. It's still cold. Climate change? Nah. <laughs> but anyways, because uh, I was off my game on Monday, I forgot to talk about something important, which I will do, and that's the extra credit project. But before I do that, let's talk about test number four. This coming Wednesday, a week from today, I will be giving test number four. Test number four, you'll be able to download it just like we've done in the other tests, and I'll send out at the end of next Wednesday's lecture and lab, I will send out an email with the password for test number four PDF file. You'll have until Thursday, 1 p.m. to finish test number four and upload it as a single PDF file, please, or Word document, either one. It should take you about 40 minutes, but hey, take as much time as you need, as long as you're not cheating. Don't do that, please. All right, test number four will cover polymers, lipids, and carbohydrates. Remember, lipids are mainly fats and oils. And test number four has nine pages, 20 problems. Some of the problems I have multiple parts. In Chem 170, I never have and never will use multiple choice. Now, here's the point breakdown. General now, 54 points. Relax, I'll explain that in a second. Nomenclature 15, reactions 36, and that adds up to 105 points, five, five, five bonus points. And again, this is not open notes or open on uh, internet or anything like that. On Monday, I will do a review for test number four. And on the Wednesday, I give it after class, we'll have our regular meeting. And don't forget the extra credit deadline is 5823. What's that? Well, I'm going to tell you in a little while. Now, before I leave this page, let's talk about general knowledge. If I ask a question on test, is your right hand chiral or achiral? Well, that's not nomenclature. That's not a reaction. So it must be general knowledge. If I ask you, how does soap work? Well, that's not nomenclature. That's not reactions. That's general knowledge. And that's why. If I ask you what's uh, an enantiomer, or draw the enantiomer of the following molecule, which we've done, and you'll see it's in the problem set too. Well, that's not nomenclature, that's not reactions. It must be general knowledge. And that's why there are 54 points general knowledge. All right, any questions about test number four? All right, let's talk about what I should have talked about on Monday, but forgot to. And that's, hold on. An extra credit project. And this extra credit project is worth 10, 10, 10 bonus points. How do you get those 10 bonus points? And this you can download from the assignment area of D2L. The extra credit project is to create a chart with 10 organic molecules, which are found in the ingredient list of commercially available products. You can use a molecule only once in the chart, and you can, but you can get up to three molecules per product. To get full credit for that molecule, all entries in a row of the chart must be correct. They must. For each entry, record the name of the product, the name of the molecule you're pointing out that's in that product, and one of the functional groups, or if there's only one functional group, what's the only functional group in that uh, molecule? Don't forget to put your name on the chart. All right, here's an example. Let's say you had brand X wine, and the molecule you picked is ethanol and the functional group is an alcohol. Now, if you had more than one functional group in a molecule, which can happen, 
you only have to name one. Now, to make it interesting, there are certain molecules you cannot use. Sucrose, also known as table sugar, ethanol or ethyl alcohol, same thing, isopropyl alcohol, also known as 2-propanol, acetone, ethyl acetate, propane, acetic acid, or methane. Now, the products you can't use, beer, wine, vegetable oil, vinegar, gasoline, propane gas, natural gas, orange juice, milk, sugar, butter, everything else is fair game. Now, this is important. Ingredients must appear on ingredients list on the product. Also, they must contain a functional group discussed in this class. I will not give points if there are other functional groups that we didn't talk about. What is the reason I'm doing that? Because in the past, before I put that in, students would put down a functional group I, we haven't discussed, and they always identify it incorrectly. They think, oh, that's a ketone. No, it's not a ketone, something else. And something like I didn't talk about, a ketene, which is something we don't cover in this class, but I've done research with. So the other thing that students get, uh, how should I say, confused, you do not have to have 10 different functional groups for the molecules. You can have a table where all of them are alcohols, as long as they're different alcohols, and you can only get three molecules per product. So you got to look at at least four different products to get 10, if I did my math correctly. Now, this is due by the end of the May 8th, which you've got two full weeks, or almost two full weeks to do, maybe less than that, but you got plenty of time. No late projects are accepted. And please upload it as a PDF file or a Word file. Now, this is optional. You don't have to do it. But if you like to get 10 points, it's like getting 10 more points on one of your test scores or like if you took the final, it would add like getting 10 more points on the final, do it. Now, to help you out, beware, not all names on labels are UPAC or common. Cymethicone, which in the, until I started putting this morning in, people would say, oh, this product has cymethicone. Oh, and the ending, it's a ketone. No, it's a silicone product or compound, but that's the name, cymethicone, it's actually a trade name. Now, how do you find what functional groups are in a molecule? Well, you can go to Google. If you go to Google or your other favorite or search engines, I like Google, put in the name of the molecule and afterward type in chemical structure. And one of the first four hits will have it. Now, the other thing is, Ask your instructor to check it, your structures. This is a special service I will provide. Before you upload it to D2L, and give me enough time, don't wait until the last minute, email me your project. I'll check it and tell you what's wrong so you can correct it. So you should be able to get 10 bonus points. Now, one other thing up here, it says must, ingredients must appear on a ingredient list. And I've had students put down the ester that you made in banana. And uh, guess what? I have never seen a banana with an ingredients list saying all the chemicals in a banana. So I mark it wrong. There's got to be an actual list ingredient list in a product. Now, what's the quickest way to do this? Well, one, go wherever you keep your personal care items like skin cream, hand lotion, all that. Look at those labels. Two, open your refrigerator and look at some of the things there, as long as it's on the do not use list, products or molecules. Or if you want to do an easy one too, Go to any big box or supermarket, so, uh, supermarket and walk down the aisle with the personal care, hand, hand lotions and all that, and pick up a couple of things, then write it down or take a picture with your cell phone, go home, and then you've got it.
Let me show you how easy it is. This is a favorite product of mine I've been using for many years. No, I don't get any money from them. If anybody knows how I can get money from them for doing a commercial now, let me know. But anyways, you, know, you put it on your lips. And when you put it on your lips, it has that little tingly feeling. And if you look at, you probably can't see it. Hold on, I know a better way. Never thought of this before. Yeah, if you see on your screen, let me make sure you're seeing it. Yep. You see here, Carmex ingredients. Oh, look, there's one, you know, phenol. And phenol has two functional groups in it, a benzene ring, and it's an alcohol. So to get your one point for that entry, You would have your table. By the way, if you don't know how to do a table in Microsoft Word, come to my office hour. I'll be more than you'll have Carmex. The molecule is phenol. And this is type, not handwritten, please. And you can put down alcohol. Or if you didn't want to put, you can put aromatic ring. Or if you wanted, you could have put for this a benzene ring, because that's I'll count that as a functional group. And if you put Carmex phenol, alcohol, or aromatic ring, you get your one point. Don't tell anybody I'm going to be nice, but you can use this and you can use that molecule and that entry on your chart, so you only need nine more. And again, you can have all the same functional group, something that's not really a functional group, but I'll let you use it, is an alkane. If you have a molecule that's just a saturated hydrocarbon that's not on the do not use list, like propane or methane, or natural gas or propane or gasoline, you can use it and call it an alkane. And again, this is 10, 10, 10 bonus points, but it is optional. All right. Any questions on that? I think you'll find it a lot of fun. Ooh, what's that? I'm really using that? Yep. All right, let's get back to work. And let me do it on my whiteboard. On Monday, I ended up showing you that if you take 50 glucose plus, and I'm just picking a number at random, a lot of glucose reacting with itself with a catalyst, as the catalyst, we call that an enzyme, you'll make starch. And I showed you on Monday, the key functional group that is in starch holding the glucose molecules together is an acetal functional group. And you learn from test number two take acid and water you'll get back the ketone or aldehyde you would have used to make that acetal plus the alcohol. And I said, you don't have to put the two there, which I do, but you don't. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you have a starch, and by the way, switch is on for all of this. Click, this is stuff you should know acid and water, and where do you get that acid and water? Your stomach. And what does it break it down to? Glucose. 
Now, you don't have to draw the structure if I were to give you something like this, what's the product or product of this reaction, but just to show you, This is glucose. And in this case, when you break down starch, the hemi, the acetal, the alcohol, and the keat aldehyde, in this case, are in the same molecule. This was the alcohol we used to make that cyclic form and then connect them together. But you should know starch when hydrolyzed with acid in your stomach makes glucose, which is why that's the sugar in your blood, because that's how your body breaks down starch. And I also mentioned sucrose table sugar when you consume it in your stomach, acid and water, what do you get? Well, sucrose is made up of an acetal linkage between fructose and group glucose. And what you get is this. Now, some of the problems on test four, I will give you the option of either draw the structure, write the name. I haven't asked you to memorize the structure of fructose and glucose, but in that reaction, if you wanted to draw it, you could, but you could have written the names. Now, leaving my class, Chem 170, you should know, hint, let me be real subtle, You should know how to describe with words in a general reaction, what happens in your stomach when you eat a carbohydrate. Let's try this again. And how do you describe that with words? Well, in your stomach, there's acid and water. So that's acid hydrolysis. And what's the key functional group holding carbohydrate starches together? An acetal. And what's the general reaction you learned for test number two? Take an acetal or ketal, react with acid and water, H plus. And what do you get? Get back the aldehyde or ketone you would have used to make that acetal or ketal plus the alcohol you would have used. And for those who must, you can put a two there, you don't have to. And you should know, if I ask with words and a general reaction, describe what happens in your stomach when you eat a carbohydrate, you should know, first of all, that's acid hydrolysis and the functional group that holds carbohydrate glu glucose together is an acetal. And the general reaction we you learned, I already knew it, so I can't say we learned, was acetal, ketal, acid and water. You get back the aldehyde or alcohol you would have used to make that acetal or ketal. And you should know this leaving my class. All right, just to remind you, I also asked you, 
to learn, you should know, leaving my class, eating a fatter oil. How to describe with words and a general reaction, what happens in your stomach when you eat a fatter oil. And again, you have acid, hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Water, so it's acid hydrolysis, acid plus water. And what's the key functional group in a fatter oil? An ester. And what's the general reaction of acid hydrolysis of an ester? You learned this for test number three. Take an ester, react it with acid, H plus, and water, and you get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. And later on, probably Monday, I will teach you the general reactions and I'll go into detail about what happens in your stomach when you eat a protein. And I'll ask you to learn how to describe that with words in a general reaction too. Because most of you are not gonna be chem majors. Most of you are going in some sort of health related, or a lot of you are. And these are a couple of things you should know. All right, let me go back and cover something that's a little complex, but something, again, I'll be subtle. Don't you like how subtle I can be? Don't answer that. <laughs> you can. All right. For test two, you learn this general reaction. Take a ketone or aldehyde. And here we have our carbonyl carbon, which will be this one, reacted with an alcohol plus acid. And you'll get this hemiacetal or hemiketal, depending what our prime is, hydrogen or carbons. Now, what you should know is this reaction. If I take glucose, it can react with itself in this reaction. And the aldehyde is right here. The alcohol is this C5, carbon number five. One, two, three, four. Oh, I counted right, five. And just like this attacks this to make this bond, this alcohol attacks the carbonyl carbon. Remember this in sugars also means this to organic chemists, who are sugar chemists too, but they have their way of writing it differently. So whatever is not involved in the chemical reaction I can just rewrite, and I will. Now, this oxygen is this oxygen and bonded to what was the carbonyl carbon. So I have my little invention, the world's ugliest, longest carbon-oxygen bond. Instead of having you learn Hawthorne structures, and then on there will be R prime is hydrogen and OH. 
and you should know how to do this. And if I give you this, you should be able to either draw the structure or write the name glucose. So it's either a give the product or products or give the starting material. And that's for glucose. And if this didn't happen, we wouldn't have all the starches, carbohydrates we have in our world. Time out while well, Dr. White cheats. No, I don't cheat. <laughs> I always get this wrong if I don't write it down. I don't know why I forget the structure of fructose so easily. It's actually one of the hydroxyl groups I get wrong all the time. Which side is it on? And being a purist, purist I like to be right. So I've written it down so I will get it right. I usually mess up one hydroxyl group historically, so this way I won't. All right, you should also know this. Yeah, I'll do subtle again. Oh, he's got this hydrox group. I just on the wrong side. And the one under it, I get wrong too, but I got it right this time because I look. All right, this is fructose. The sweet, excuse me, the sweetest sugar. And you should know if I put this on a test like that, give the product or product, what is that? And it's the same reaction. The alcohol attacks the carbonyl carbon and forms this hemiacetal, hemiketal. Same reaction. Same carbon, C5. And this now attacks a ketone here at C2. And once again, and I'll draw this in so you know, what's not involved in the chemical reaction is the same. Now, let me write this reaction here again. So this hydroxyl group will be bonded to second carbon here which is this carbon right here. And it will have on there an OH group and this bond to the oxygen, which instead of having you learn and this is the cyclic form of fructose. So if I give you this structure, you should know how to get this product. If I give you this product, you should know either how to get back to the structure of fructose or put the name fructose down. Because if this didn't happen, we wouldn't have table sugar, which I think is pretty important. Now, while I'm talking about things you should know, this morning when I was washing my hands, I was thinking, oh, I'm making my cells. I was probably the only one in my suburb who thought that, but Something you should know leaving my class. Wow, I'm giving a lot of hints today.
And what should you know? You should know how to describe how does soap work? <clears throat> oh, excuse me, I'm getting all choked up over this. You should know the structure of soap. It has a nonpolar tail, also Sue, and a polar head. Now, water, which you use to clean up, is polar. Dirt and grease, I forgot to mention the other day when I mentioned this, a couple of years ago, I was watching TV and somebody was trying to show this new laundry detergent is real good and says, so good, it cleans greasy dirt. I started laughing. These are nonpolar. And the key to the puzzle, how soap works is Notice I went to my favorite, you should know this color in a larger font, because the whole key to the puzzle, <clears throat> excuse me, how soap works is like dissolves light. And you should know that when you have a small piece of dirt, dirt is nonpolar, soap has a nonpolar tail, and that's attracted to the dirt. The polar head stays as far away and it forms, forms a so circular, so I guess circular sphere. And you should know this is called a micelle when this happens. And now, well, let's do one more soap. Actually, it's a lot of soap molecules. Water looks at the dirt originally says, oh, you're nonpolar, I'm polar. I don't want anything to do with you because I know like dissolves like. But now water looks at the Didn't know water molecules had eyes. Oh, that was a bad joke. Sorry. At the micelle, am I spelling that right? I don't know. Anyways, and says, oh, and all these is the polar heads around the mice of the micelle surrounding the dirt, and says, oh, micelle, I'm polar, you're polar, let's go down the drain together. And they do. And that's how you get your hands clothes clean, your clothes clean, your car clean. I've got to wash my car maybe this, I don't know about this weekend but soon it needs it and I'll wax it. But anyways, again, you should know how does soap work? It's got a nonpolar tail, polar head. Water's polar, dirt and grease, you're trying to get off something you're cleaning is nonpolar. The key to the puzzle is like dissolves light. And because of that, dirt being nonpolar, attracts the nonpolar tail of the soap to form a micelle. And the micelle, am I, okay. I think there shouldn't be an H there. Hold on, it's really bothering me and that's not a good thing to be bothered. Yep, no H, sorry about that. I tell you, I was always first one down in a spelling bee.
No, Michelle's not in this. There. All right. And you should know it forms a micelle, which now looks polar to water and goes down to drain together. All right. Now let's have some fun with chemistry, organic chemistry. If you look on your screen right now, you'll see the bottom molecule is starch, which is glucose linked together in a polymer, which N is large, real large. Now, on top is cellulose. That's things like paper is cellulose, your trees and other cell, the cell walls, now I'm going well beyond my knowledge of biology, but are made of cellulose. Upon hydrolysis, they both give glucose. But if you look here, notice the oxygen bond between the two molecules. Both are underneath, the bond is underneath the rings. And that's called either alpha, beta. I'm not a carbohydrate chemist, so I forget. Now, in cellulose, it's below and above. It starts above, and then it goes underneath. And that means cellulose has a different stereochemistry than starch. And that means a big difference. What kind of difference? The hydrolysis time. Starch, you eat, and your stomach can break it down to glucose. If you were starving, paper, like on a post it or paper, is cellulose you eat it, it's not going to keep you alive. Why? Because it doesn't have enough time in your stomach to break down. Now, if you go and look at a cow, and now I'm way beyond my level of animal husbandry, but they have four stomachs. If you look at a horse or an elephant, they have a big stomach. Why? Because it needs more time. Their body needs, the cellulose needs more time to be broken down by acid and water. And that larger stomach or the four stomachs allows that. Now, cellulose is a product you can get. They can purify it from plants. And it's a white crystal material. You can dissolve in it. And you can do chemistry with it. Chemistry we know. Now, one that I haven't talked about. This is a chemistry you can do, and you're familiar with cellophane. Cellophane is that crinkly, clear, or colored plastic around candy and other things you can get. And what cellophane click the switches off is this molecule, cell, a cellulose, reacting with sodium hydroxide and uh, carbon disulfide to give this. And I have no idea what that functional group is called in red but because I really never worked with sulfur compounds, but that's that crinkly stuff. Now, another one is, I didn't teach in this class, but you can nitrate an alcohol to put a nitro group on the carbon that the alcohol was originally. And um, one of the first uses was nitrocellulose. And nitrocellulose, and here's the structure, you see the nitro group on the carbon that had the alcohol, some of them, of cellulose. Now, this was can be made into film. And fortunately, the movies made in the 1910, 1920s were made on nitrocellulose film. Nitrocellulose itself deteriorates and can explode, like nitroglycerin, not as bad. And by the 1960s or 70s, this was happening to some of the old movies that had been stored. 
And since then, I forgot which movie stars and studios started uh, saving them by transferring them over first to regular film. We now use that's much more stable. But in the last 20 years or 30 years, I forgot how long, they've been digitizing it, which is even better. Now, I'm going to get into something that I'm just talking to chemistry about. So please don't get upset. <laughs> Ooh, what's he going to talk about? Now, a reaction you learned for test two. If I take an alcohol, react with ethylene oxide. I make this compound, an ether alcohol. And you learned that for test number two. And I showed you some examples in real life. Well, let's talk about another one. Here's the structure of cellulose. And notice you have all these nice hydroxyl groups, alcohols that I can react. Guess what? You can react that with ethylene oxide. And you make this molecule. Notice you have OR on that alcohol. And R can be, if it didn't react, H, which is an alcohol, or CH2, CH2OH, which is just the alcohol reacting with ethylene oxide. So if I take cellulose and react it with ethylene oxide, I get this new material called uh, hydroxyethyl cellulose. And what's it used for? To thicken things. And what's something that's really thick and viscous? Viscous means really thick. And that's KY jelly. KY jelly personal lubricant is a lubricant for something personal activity a man and a woman do. And I'll leave it at that and let you figure it out. But the ingredients are mainly water and glycerin. Glycerin isn't that thick. And you know water isn't that thick. But look, it's got hydroxyethyl cellulose, and that's what makes it that thick, viscous material. In industry, when you want to thicken up something, you use that. Now, in cooking, what do you make? You make a roux, which is starch, which is similar to hydroxyethyl cellulose, but hydroxyethyl cellulose is very water-soluble water and makes that thick viscous material that's a good lubricant. The rest of those are molecules that are antimicrobial or help pH adjust and thicken things up. And that's some of the neat things you've been learning that combine together to make products that are sold to help people with whatever they need help for. And you can go to your local big box store or supermarket and many of their products are made with that. And that's organic chemistry. Now, let's take a five minute break and we'll come back and do the lab. I can go get up and stretch. I'll see you in five.
Let's get going. Let's see, I talked about the extra credit project, so I can put that over there. All right, it's lab time. I'm sad. Why am I sad? This is a fun lab to do in the lab. And if you want, you can do this lab yourself at home if you have some time, not for to hand it in, but to have some fun. Now, as I've told you in the past, I think I told you, when I inherited Chem 170, when I took it over, the labs were, or should I be polite, awful, actually beyond awful. And I challenged myself to write new labs. And because if we were face-to-face, -face, unlike other schools, uh, Chem 170 only has an hour and 50 minutes. In other schools, it's two hours and 50 minutes, which means you can't use most of the lab books for uh, one semester organic because the labs are a little over two and a half hours. And if it's, I only have an hour and 50 minutes with you in a lab, I can't do it. So I wrote my own. I needed one more lab for the semester to do. And I thought, all right, I did the basic functional groups and all that, and you've done that this semester. How can I come up with something really exciting, challenging, and inexpensive? The college isn't going to let me buy thousands of dollars of equipment or anything like that for one lab. And I challenged myself even further by saying to myself, one, you're an industrial organic chemist, have been for decades, even though I've been teaching for a long time too. And two, you're also a surfactant ke organic chemist, industrial organic, work with surfactants. And I came up with an interesting lab. And I also said to myself, how can I give the students an experience like working in a real research lab? And I came up with this lab. And what's the lab? Developing competitive products. Now, in industry, and I've done this many times, I've been in a meeting with the vice president of marketing and sales or the president of vice pres president of the company or the even higher, the CEO of the company, an international company. And they'll say, our competitor makes this product and we don't. They're making a lot of money with it. We should make some money doing something like that. Come up with a similar competitor product. Well, that's what you have to do. And we use our understanding of functional group chemistry, knowledge of the patent literature, which is an exciting area where to get information about organic chemistry and companies, and knowledge of existing product composition, which you can get from the patent literature in other ways I can't talk about. But anyways, in the lab today, you're going to be my research group when we are face-to-face. And you're going to develop and test different formulations for a product. Okay. Everybody see on your screen right now? Let me make sure you can. Super miracle bubbles. And in the lab, we actually have this. And I hand these out to each group. You and the, When we do face-to-face, -face, you work in groups of two with a partner. And I give you these bottles, actually the school bought them. And this is part of what we're going to do. There's a lot of money to be made with this type of product. This is mostly water. And if I can sell you six bottles of little bottles of water for $5, I'm going to make a lot of money. And they do. And also there are patents on different types of solutions making bubbles. What you don't know, but I do because I have 10 U.S. patents, is it costs a lot of money to get a patent. We've got to do the research. That's money paying chemists like me. Then you've got to pay a lawyer to write the patents. That's a lot of money. 
usually about 20,000 nowadays, maybe more. And then you've got to file with the government in Washington, and that's about another five to $10,000. So if you're not going to make money with a patent, you don't file one because you're going to lose a lot of money. Well, your job today is come up with a competitive product that competes, will compete with super miracle bubbles. Now, at this point, if we were face-to-face, -face, I'm not going to do it with my computer screen, I'd take it out and blow a bubbles. <laughs> That's the hardest part of today's lab, blowing bubbles. Some people can't do it. I have to practice the first time. Now, what's a bubble? I bet you never thought about what's a bubble. Well, a bubble is air in the inside, this outside, which is water plus stuff, and then outside is air. Now, what you don't know, but I'm going to tell you right now, air is nonpolar and water is polar. So how do you make a bubble, that outer layer? You use surfactants. And surfactants are molecules that have a polar tail and a nonpolar a non tail and polar head, most of them. And what happens is the surfactant in a bubble, the air part in the side will attract the nonpolar tail and the water the head will want to be and the outside will be attracted by that. And this happens all around to hold the water in place around the air in the center to form a bubble. And this is another type and I'll try and spell it right. A bubble is really a micelle. A different, there are different types of micelles. The one in soap and dirt you saw, this is a different one. We call that a bubble. Well, what are you going to do in this lab? You're going to be using different surfactants in formulations to find out what's the best bubble blowing solution you can make so we can sell it to compete with the Miracle Super Bubble. Now, what surfactants are you going to be using? The one you're going to be using dishwasher soap, liquid hand soap, and laundry detergent. Now, from reading the patent literature for bubbles, which I did, that's part of my job as a PhD chemist in chemical companies to learn about things I don't know so I can make things that haven't been made, and I've done that. Their are patents that say glycerin and corn syrup have been added to water and your surfactant to make better bubbles. And I'll be providing you those structures in a little while. Now, when you do a, an experiment, there's a rule that a lot of chemists forget. And when I got into industry, I had some great mentors. One of them, Sid Shapiro, beat into my head, and also my boss, uh, Bob McDaniels. Wow, that was decades ago. A great, I, had, I was lucky to have a great start like that in the chemical industry. They always reminded me, and other people too, whenever you do an experiment, research, you only change one variable at a time. You only change one variable at a time. Because if you change two and it works, what made it work? If you change two and it doesn't work, well, maybe one would have worked without the other. You don't know. So you only change one variable at a time. Now, another thing about doing research in industry, time is money. And you don't want to waste a lot of time doing things that don't help you solve a problem. And that's where you learn what's called DOE, design of experiments, which I know and you don't. So I'm going to help you out in this lab. That's where you form a matrix of experiments where at the end of the day, you look at it, you've just changed one variable here, here, here. But in a short amount of time, you can get a lot of information, but still keeping to the rule 
you only change one variable at a time. Now, you're going to be doing a couple of parts. In part A, you're going to be testing how good a surfactant to blow bubbles is dishwashing soap. And dishwashing soap like Dawn has many things in it to make it work well, but this is the main structure of the surfactant in Dawn. And usually this is about 12 to 16 carbons long, CH2, 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 CH3. And then you have the sulfate ester, which we haven't talked about. So you have a polar head, and this is your nonpolar tail. Now, you're going to be making a number of solutions to try. And this is where I do my job. If I had chemists working with me at my level, I'd assist them, but expect them to set up something like this on their own. And an A1 will have two milliliters of the dishwashing soap and 18 milliliters of water to test. In A2, we've doubled the amount of surfactant, four and 16. Now, A3, what's ever left of A2, you'll add five drops of glycerin. And A4, we're using the higher concentration of soap with also more glycerin, 10 drops. Now, in A5, you'll make another A2 and test as cornstarch help. And that's the experiments. Now, when you make a solution, how do you test? Is it a good product? And that was an idea I had to come up with because the expensive equipment you check bubbles, we're not going to buy. So what I came up with was the idea that you blow bubbles with your solution and time how long until the bubble collapses or dies. Now, whenever you're doing research, you have the commercial product you're working against, and that's your benchmark. That's where that name came from. And here, if I would have you, and I'm putting the data, you would blow bubbles with the commercial product. And you take the average of five bubbles. Now, if a bubble, you may have to blow more than five, but time, get at least five good bubbles. And for the commercial, it would be the average would be each bubble, the average about 10 seconds. And here I have the different formulations, A1 through A4, that, that you would do. Now, if we were face to face, I would tell you, one, it's not polite to bust your neighbor's bubbles. Students started doing that the first or second lab. I had to tell them, no, it's not polite to blow bubbles at your neighbors or at Dr. White, nah. The other thing is wipe up the floor because it gets real slippery. And the last thing is, listen carefully. If after 10 or 12 tries, you can't get one bubble, put down zero for the average time. So you would do this for the, and here we use Dawn dishwashing soap. And actually, if you want to at home, you can try this too, you don't have to, but you can have a party with friends blowing bubbles and you can make your own bubble solution. All right, in part B, we'll do the same thing except with liquid hand soap, which you all probably have. And there, the key surfactant is similar to Dawn, but to make it more skin friendly, they have this, an alcohol, they ethoxylate it, and then they have the same sulfate polar head. And if you have dial, and uh, if we did this at ECC, I think we use dial liquid hand soap. And again, this is C12 to C16. So you have your nonpolar tail.
and here, polar head. And water that forms of my cell for the bubbles. And you'll do the same, similar thing. You'll test how long does the bubble last. I have similar formulations. This is where you uh, build the matrix. B2 is similar, or B1 is similar to A1, except we're now going to do two grams. Why two grams, not two milliliters? Because the liquid hand soap is more viscous than the Dawn dishwashing. So it's hard to get out of graduated cylinder. So I figured this way it is essentially the same. Two grams of the soap, 18 milliliters of water, B2 is four grams. You've doubled the amount of soap or surfactant and 16 water. B3 is B1 plus five drops of glycerin and 4B, because if I say B4, before what and I did it, I'm sorry. Anyways, that's all B2 plus 10 grams of glycerin. And finally, B5, take the B2 and add a new solution of B2 and add 10 grams of the cornstarch. And you test this again. And if we were doing this, I'd have fun walking around watching you blow bubbles. I bring a camera too, and I have pictures of the past. And now, here's something important. You notice the top here where I have the commercial product. You only have to do it once. And in real life, in the research notebook, once you've done it once, you copy it like this into other data charts, and people know you're copying that. But if you were to do B1, the average of five different bubbles would be seven and B2 and so on. And here's the data. Now, the last one of the surfactants you'll test is the laundry detergent. We use all. Why? Because I've been using it for decades. I like it. It works well. And here you have a LAS linear alkyl sulfonate. And this is your nonpolar tail, the benzene ring and the R group. And this, you have your polar head. And that's how it gets your cl clothes clean, just like I've shown you making my cells with the dirt or grease on there. Now here, you do the same thing. C1, again, similar concentration and now a different surfactant with water. You double the concentration of C2. C3, you take C1, add the five drops of glycerin. C4, you add the five, C2. 10 drops of glycerin, and C5, you make another C2 and add 10 drops of cornstarch. And here's the data. I'm going to come back to this in a little while. Now, after a second or third time I did this lab, a really sharp student came up to me and said, Dr. White, can we do our own? And I said, that's a good idea. As long as you use the chemicals that are, we're doing in this lab, go for it. And they did, and they had a lot of fun. And they came up with some great formulations. About three summers or four summers ago, we had one group, and I sort of remember their formulation, but they had one bubble that lasted close to five minutes. By the end of the third minute, the whole class had stopped doing the, the lab and just watched that bubble for another two minutes. It was awesome. But part D, you're no, you don't have to fill in. But if you ever want to have fun, you can do this on your own because glycerin you can buy at Walmart and other places. Um, Cornstarch, you know where you can get any supermarket. And Dawn or Dial, you can get at any big box store. And you can make a lot of bubbles and have fun. Now, to make it real world, if we're doing the lab, I told the students like you, if we were face to face, once you've done all the research, look at it and you have to get credit for this lab. 
pick your best formulation, one I've made up or your own, and then call me over. And each partner just has to blow two bubbles. And when the big boss is watching you, <laughs> the pressure's on, sometimes things get hard to do, like blowing bubbles. And I initial it. In real life, if somebody does research, uh, it doesn't get put out until I see that it's really valid. Now, before we go any further, I've got a couple stories to tell you. First story is, when I was working at Unichema, part of my job, it was a research center. I also was in charge of quality control at the plant, which was at 47th and Racine, not far from White Sox, the old White Sox Comiskey Park, that we had two massive um, waste treatment ponds. Each were the size of a football field and about 20 feet deep, I think at least a million gallons in each. And somehow we had an, bought this chemical plant from Darling Chemo, uh, Chemical or Rendering, and they still had the plant running. They were going to close it in a couple of years. That was part of the deal. And we bought the chemical plant part of it, we being Unichemical Chemical, not Dr. White. Now, the plant, the rendering plants sometimes would, when they'd render dead animals, not a pleasant thought, but that's where a lot of your fat comes for your products that you use. They'd dump some blood into the one of the ponds and it would kill all the microbes that ate up the fat in there, our waste. And also sometimes they got stuff in there and it caused one time a foam. And this foam was rising and starting to go toward 47th Street. And if it hit 47th, no, it was Racine, we would have been charged at least a million dollars in fines by the city of Chicago. Well, I got, what the heck? And the president came and saw it. He said, fix it <laughs> to me. And being a surfactant chemist, I know there are molecules or compounds you can add that make bubbles. That's what you're looking at today. There are other compounds that stop foam or bubble formation. Foam is just really a lot of bubbles together. And that's called a defoamer. And because of the money involved, I found one real quick, but the only source I could get it was a company in California. I needed five drums, that's 500 pounds roughly per drum. We actually had um, what would be a charter to plane to fly from California to Chicago here, those five drums overnight. Uh, FedEx doesn't do drums of chemicals. It was pretty expensive, but a lot less than a million dollars. And those five drums put the chemical in, boom. Foam was gone in a million gallons of water. So there are foamers, molecules that make foam, like in your soap used for your hand. Oh, it's foaming. That not only the surfactant, but chemicals, and others that defoam. Now, another company I worked at, the senior managers and research had a thing that happened, started before I went, started working there and I did it. We have to Friday after the end of the day, there was a local pub or bar, really a dive. They had no windows, some tables and a stand-up bar. We go over, have a few beers, uh, commiserate with each other, our employees who are stupid, some who did stupid things, or upper management, how dumb they were, just blow off seam end of week. Well, the owner of this bar had a skill he had developed. He could sell a pitcher of beer that a third of it was foam. And if you complained, he said, well, go somewhere else. Well, I wish I could say I took credit for this, but I can't. One of the other managers who knew surfactants as well as I did got really upset. And what you don't know is when you are at a chemical company and you sell chemicals, you have what's called a sample room. And the sample room to potential customers or existing customers, they can get samples of your products to test them their products, and you can get, get sales with them then. And you can get anywhere from small amount, a couple ounces up to five gallons free, depending how big of a customer you might or are. And there are two types of chemicals you don't know about. One is industrial, the other is food. Food grade chemicals are not only chemically pure, 
but they're, I guess the right term would be, I don't know if it's really right, biologically pure. There's nothing in there biologically like microbes or virus or germs that will get you sick by consuming it. Well, this manager knew surfactants like I did, got a sample of a defomer and put it in a little squeeze bottle. And when we got to this bar, he said, don't tell anybody. And you finish the pitcher, we finished the pitcher, put some of the defomer in there, food grade, so it's safe to eat, and swirl around. We need a new pitcher. And the owner came over and got it. If you've ever been in certain bars, they have a sink where it's got soap and water to rinse out the pitchers and a couple more just to rinse it out. Well, after one or two pitchers, we contaminated those sinks with defomer and he couldn't get a foam on there. And he was getting madder and we've stayed a little longer and had a few more beers and we're laughing our head off. But I said, you guys are chemists, what'd you do? Oh, we didn't do anything. And he said, get out of here, never come back. We found another place where he didn't get a third of a pitcher of foam. But there are chemicals that are foamers and those are defoamers. Now, when we do the lab, remember if you have five or 10 times or more above trying to blow a bubble and you can't, you put down a zero. Now, if you look at part C, you're using a laundry detergent. And if you notice, they're all zeros. And I'd go around students and they'd come to me and say, Dr. White, we can't blow any bubbles with this formulation. And I say, what don't you want in a laundry machine ever? And the answer is bubbles, foam. And a couple of times students have told me about how they have run out of laundry detergent and used Dawn dishwashing soap. And guess what? That's got a foamer in there and their whole laundry room was filled with foam. So that's the story I thought I'd tell you a couple of them. Those are true stories. Well, I don't tell fake ones. And here are the questions for this lab. And I hope you, if you have a chance, blow some bubbles at home if you ever want to using the formulations part A or B. And with that, Monday, I will go through the carbohydrates problem set. Monday, I will do the review for test number four. And with that, I'm done for today. Oh, excuse me. And I'll say, gang gazun, goodbye now. If you need help, come to my office hour tonight. And if not, have a nice rest of the week and weekend. And I'll see you on Monday. Don't forget, hand in the lab. That's due today. Gang gazun, goodbye.